All right, let's start with the rapid fire round. The first one, describe what your organization does in one sentence. The Fundamental Rights Agency advises the EU so that it is human rights compliant in its, in its work, its laws and its policies. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? Oh, it takes me a good half an hour on a good morning, a lot longer on the bad days. Most valuable skill you've learned in life? Patience. City in which the best kiss of your life happened? Dublin. How many speakers can you name at this conference? About 20. Name them. No. <laughs> <laughs> in one sentence, describe one problem that your organization is facing. Resources. We never have enough resources to do the job that we need to do for European citizens. How do you relax? I relax by visiting art galleries. A habit of yours that you hate? Uh, talking over other people. Work from home or work from office? A bit of both. Most embarrassing moment of your life? I embarrass myself every day. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? I, I can survive well on seven. Your favorite app? My favorite app, news apps, Irish Times, BBC. Biggest mistake of your career? Not doing adequate pension planning. First movie that comes to your mind when I say the word technology? Social network. How many cups of coffee do you drink in a day? Far too many, but that's about five. Your favorite Netflix show? Uh, Dirty Girls. All right, so that's the end of the rapid fire round. We're going to move on to the bigger questions and you can answer these with yeah. as much ease and length as you like. The first one is, are governments acting fast enough to guarantee individual rights in the face of rapidly evolving artificial intelligence technologies or do they need support from non-governmental organizations? No, they're not moving fast enough. We've got to speed up our game, but we've got to do it very carefully based on solid research, know what we're doing, um, uh, uh, come up with regulatory models that work for a very complex, fast evolving uh, context uh, where we have to look at not just uh, tech in general, but its application, its uses. Uh, 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 and only on that basis then can we put in place the right, um, uh, uh, the right regulatory frame. Civil society plays a critically important role. Civil society is the voice of rights holders, the voice of citizens, and we need that voice to be fed in to the discussions. Uh, governments don't automatically know what the issues are, what the challenges are, where the problems are lying hidden. Uh, that's what we gather from civil society out there, incredibly well skilled, right across uh, all of the sectors. Uh, and uh, without them, we'll do it. We, we won't get it right. So what are some of the ways civil society can be involved in this? It's a very good question. Uh, we, we have to make sure to maintain organized spaces where there can be exchanges of views with civil society. And uh, they tell us that when they're consulted, often they're not listened to uh, and that uh, they're, they're asked for their views, but they aren't given enough time or opportunity to express those views. And that, they're give, and that they don't often get the sense that they've been listened to. So be it in the tech world, the AI world or any other, uh, we have to invest far more in creating these spaces uh, where, where they can express the view and it, it has a meaningful impact. And by the way, one group that's shouting very loud about this is young people. Young civil society feels particularly excluded uh, in decisions that have massive implications for their future. How would you define a human rights based approach to technology in the first place? Human rights has no value in and of itself. Human rights is just a set of tools to honor human dignity. And so the answer to your question is that um, a, a, a technology and the regulation of technology will be human rights based when its goal is, is honoring a human dignity in all its wonderful diversity, making sure that every single one of us is respected uh, in these settings. What, according to you, are the main points of contention in the debate between privacy advocates and AI developers? Uh, there are many points of contention. The first is that they misunderstand each other um, because it's about so much more than privacy. Um, uh, it's often reduced just to being a human rights is just an issue of privacy, but it's about every human right. Uh, look at the way AI works in reality in our lives and you see the, the extent to which everything about who we are is engaged. Um, it's about our free speech. It's about our free movement. It's our association. It's our social welfare entitlements with a tech 
app is making a decision about whether I get the social welfare or not. It's about my job. It's about my access to school, to housing. The list goes on. Even as we move into the next generation of, of technology, it's about human identity itself. Uh, it's going to be, the issue is going to arise of uh, what does it take to be a human? Uh, at what point have we created artificially something equivalent to a human? We're not there yet, thank goodness. Uh, but it, my point is that it's, it's every imaginable issue. And in engaging all of those issues, the biggest challenge right now is transparency. Uh, it is imperative that the industry open up uh, and, and, and make clear what it's doing, uh, the content of algorithms, the content of training materials, uh, and that uh, I, I, and they'll tell you that it's not possible in many cases. We challenge that. Uh, this black box has a lid. We need to prize open the lid. Now, we can have discussions about what transparency looks like in practice. I can see that. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to have those conversations. I'm afraid of a future uh, within which uh, we will not have achieved transparency for these extraordinary technologies, which such huge implications for human well-being. So what are the arguments on the side of people who are saying that it's hard to be transparent in this? Uh, the arguments uh, on, on, the side, uh, on their side are not convincing. <laughs> the, um, I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer. Um, but I refuse to concede without uh, I, I refuse to concede uh, that this is magic. Uh, this is the technology is invented by people, uh, controlled by people for purposes that they consider useful for people. Um, so how come people cannot uh, uh, understand what's going on? Uh, now I, I am told that there's a dimension uh, of, of of certain types of AI that operate in such an opaque way that it's actually difficult even for the designer to understand quite why it worked. Um, all we're saying is let's at least have the conversation with those people around these technologies and see to what extent we can draw out adequate information uh, so that we can, for example, regulate in an appropriate way. How can we make sure that AI tools do not discriminate against certain groups? Well, the first place we have to say that AI tools are capable of astonishing levels of discrimination. Uh, we can attempt to remove uh, inappropriate, by, oh, by the way, all tech is biased. It, 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 it is intended in a certain direction. Uh, so not all bias is bad, uh, but bias that distinguishes between people on what we call protected characteristics, uh, your gender, your age, your race, your ethnicity, your religion, uh, your sexual orientation, your gender identity, that's bad. Uh, and um, we see from our research that time and time again, despite genuine efforts to, 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 to remove the bad bias, uh, it, it, it's, it's still in there, for instance, through proxies. Uh, and still in there through the proxies, uh, it, 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 it grows ever more distinctive through the feedback loops. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, very important to tackle these. Um, they, 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 they constitute one of the biggest concerns we have for the application of artificial intelligence today. And this game of catch up, like, has, is it ever going to end or is it going to get worse and worse exact? Is it going to exacerbate into worse and worse situations? Um, I'm, I, 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 I'm not going to take the question in those terms. It doesn't have to be worse and worse. It can be better and better. Uh, AI is the most astonishing uh, potential tool for human thriving uh, that we've seen in, um, in, 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 in our history, I would argue. Um, if it's marshaled and channeled uh, in, 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 in the right direction with the right levels of care. So we can have an astonishingly good future for human beings through a smart application of artificial intelligence. The, um, but we will always be catching up. That's the nature of technology. Is it ever different in any other sector? Things are constantly in evolution. Uh, and so the law and the regulator and the oversight it will never stop uh, just mo moving along as the technology moves. Uh, the, the, the key here is to avoid any sense of complacency. Um, we have to, for example, in the EU, put in place an AI regulation that's, that's smart and anticipatory for the future, that can already identify, not identify, but can al already be poised to address future applications that we can't even think of today. So the EU has begun to play the global technology game. Where would you say the EU is in this game in terms of sophistication, strategy, resources and vision, especially in comparison to US, Russia and China? Yeah, um, the EU believes in trustworthy AI. Uh, and that, by the way, is the only AI that's compatible with respect for human rights. So I'm very proud to play my own small role in my agency, proud to play its role in developing this regulatory framework. Uh, so. Uh, uh, 
and by the way, you've mentioned other parts of the world. I believe in the longer term, uh, the trustworthy AI that the EU approach is, 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 is championing will ultimately be the more successful one. Because frankly, consumers, users, people, citizens, uh, they're, only they're only going to tolerate an AI that they can trust, that they see is oriented to human well-being. What do you think about the evolving role of algorithms in society and how it affects our ability to make informed decisions? I, I think that society isn't adequately aware of the extent to which algorithms are playing vital roles uh, uh, in, in people's lives. Um, for example, the, I think there's a low level of awareness of the extent to which the state is using algorithms. Uh, there was a scandal last year in, in one country, in the Netherlands, where um, social welfare payments were taken back from individuals uh, on the basis, it was ultimately learned, of the, the discriminatory application of an algorithm, a racist, essentially, action of an algorithm. I don't doubt the whole thing was unintended, but it's a, it, it was a state, uh, it was a state service uh, 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 which was impacted here. So we need our citizens to wake up to the extent to which algorithms are in play. We need public debates about the extent to which that is or is not acceptable uh, to, to people on, on the European streets. Uh, and we need also an exposure of that reality to allow people to make complaints if they feel they've been wronged. Uh, you won't complain about the decision made by an algorithm where you're not even aware that such a decision was taken that impacted you negatively. How successful do you think the EU has been in shaping global standards of privacy and data protection? I think it's been the world leader. Uh, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, uh, it was, was a global first. Uh, and it may not be perfect, nothing is, uh, and nothing human made is perfect. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a very serious effort to, to protect this, this very important human right of privacy. It's not an absolute right, but nevertheless, we have to protect it very carefully to avoid the abuses of privacy that led to such horrors as, to take the most extreme example, the genocide, uh, the Holocaust here in Europe. Um, so the European leadership there has been uh, very important. You know, even if it were copied nowhere else, I would applaud it, but it has been copied. Uh, it, 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 it has been taken, it's been adapted locally in many countries around the world. Uh, proof, if any were needed, uh, that it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was not an act of folly, but rather a, a commitment to global values and a pathway towards uh, honouring them. All right, so the last question is of a personal kind. It is, what would you be doing in your life if not this right now? Yeah, um, I've spent so much of my life working in the area of human rights, I would find it really hard to know what I would do otherwise. Uh, I think I'd like to be an art dealer. I'd be a very bad art dealer, but I think I'd like that. That was amazing. It was great listening to you.